Hello everyone, I'm Mrs. Sherman. Welcome to Homemakers Radio and welcome to the manse. Now if you're new here, please click the link in the description on the YouTube video and go to the post on which I'm placing this video and you can leave a comment there if you like. But you get to see some other things there like a summary of what I said and a few photographs. And so the first thing we do is get ready, get dressed, and I'll share my teacup with you before you go to go do a few things around the house while you listen. I hope you get a lot done. Um, I got this at Home Goods some time ago. It's one of those Stetch Call Gracie Bone China sets. They're not expensive and they're so lovely. They look just like the antiques, but they're a bit more sturdy and some of them you can uh, put in the dishwasher. I never do, but I wanted you to see this one. It kind of went with my with my outfit today. Well, I hope you're all doing well. I always hate to ask. I know with the uh, isolation and um, captivity, people can get very discouraged. And one of the things uh, that my one of my grandchildren who likes to study ancient history and wars and details about the way people won or lost, and he mentioned that there was one group of people that was captive that would not allow themselves to be broken. And when you know, when you have knowledge, you will not break down. And to break down your mind, they would have to isolate you and discourage you and feed you uh, discouraging messages so that you would feel defeated. Because if they can defeat your mind, then they've got, they've won the battle. And this has been going on here for, for, all of our lives really people trying to defeat you and I remember reading when the web first came out and some lady had a card business that she was showing these new rubber stamps and she had a beautiful uh, videos out each time telling what she was doing with them and where you could get the stamps and she got so much criticism and negativity and she finally had to and then she'd be uh, off for a while because it takes a while to recover for some people and she finally said she had to that this year during New Year's resolutions she was going to ignore all the negative and jealous remarks because basically people who have time to do that really aren't accomplishing anything in life they're just keeping other people from accomplishing things they think that's their mission and we see these people all through the scriptures you can see it uh, the more you more knowledge you have about it the more you can point it you can identify it in the Bible so today I'd like to read to you about first I want to encourage you to get dressed up because getting dressed up I have a little note here I wrote to myself that I thought of today uh, dressing up makes the tasks seem more important and more special and when you have a beautiful home that you've taken care of it doesn't have to be a wealthy place it can be some place like the manse but I love thinking of it in certain seasons there's a certain way the light comes in or maybe it's a a very warm day it feels very tropical and stuff and I like to think of it as some kind of a great resort and it changes the way that I approach some of the ordinary jobs and so I encourage you to think that way these are the way these are the things that great novelists use to write stories and so today I'm going to read to you a little bit more from the book that I've been using and I want to read to you from the book of Exodus because it means the going out and the exit and it's when the Hebrew uh, captives were set free and began their long journey and out of the land of Goshen and so I want to read a little paragraph to you from chapter 2 verse 23 through 25 it was something that I was mentioning in my previous video I'd like to elaborate on it a little bit during those many days the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob and God saw the people of Israel and God knew. And so this is when God raised up Moses to help them leave. And when I think of this, when I read this, I think of how those who love God and 
and who are dedicated to the teachings of Christ and are in the body of Christ, God knows you. Your name is written in the book of life. And so you need to send up prayers to ask for relief and rescue from these times, which are keeping us from doing all the things and, and exercising all the potential that God gave us because it's not right uh, for people to enslave us or to uh, lock us up. So we want to, but in captivity, I want to encourage you to get strong and to get smart and to get healthy and to get creative. Use that time because once you're free, the work is going to be on. You're going to be busy. You're going to be going. You're going not going to have the time. So use it as a time to self-improve. And remember that in captivity, people have got strong. You remember Samson, the... Uh, who was it? The Philistines had him locked up, had him in captivity, and they didn't notice that his strength was coming back. So he, they were very surprised when he pushed down the pillars of the temple that he was standing under and uh, took a lot of them with him. So get strong, and that way uh, you can take care of yourself and you will be, you will be able to protect your family and protect yourself. And when you get physically fit, it changes your mind too. And your mind can no longer be uh, pulled in to uh, depressing thoughts. So ladies, I have been using the rebounder a little bit, not as much as I should, but I've been going for a, a stroll outside, a Jane Austen stroll outside, and not worrying so much about um, my weight, uh, and just enjoying the fresh air and going for a walk for the sake of it, you know, and not being so absorbed in uh, fitness. I, when I say be fit, at least be healthy and uh, reasonably strong, able to uh, able to survive if you have to lift something, if you have to move something. And so be fit because you can surprise a lot of people if you're fit. Also, I would like to encourage you to exercise your freedom in the home as homemakers. And one of the things that you can do is you can move things, you can rearrange things, you can clean things, you can redo, refurnish, redecorate, all those things. And you can learn things. You know, I knew of a lady who decided that she wanted uh, new cabinets and decided that and she was a widow, but she was, she was fairly fit. And she decided, well, she would just learn how to build them herself. And she built herself some new cabinets in her kitchen. And she built herself a couple of other things too. So you can learn anything. We don't have to be dependent on everything to be made for us or done for us. We can learn to be do-it-yourselfers. You know, I also like to have a real feel-good story or book to read or book to look at uh, at night, especially to wind down and sometimes maybe a movie. And I noticed a few years ago how some of the movies, the Hallmark movies, especially the ones that were produced in Canada, had the theme of going back to grandma's farm or back to the country. Uh, people who hadn't done well in, the, in big business in the city and had gotten where they put a new perspective on their life when they failed in something and they decided that maybe the country town that they grew up in or the uh, farm that they lived on was really better than it than they thought you know before they went for the lights of the the nightlife and the big city and independence and a lot of the themes of these movies are about coming home and one of them that was one of my favorites that I watched, and I believe you can still get, um, I'll try to put a link to it. Sometimes after I put a link to a movie, the, it goes off the air. <laughs> but it was called Finding Normal. And I always enjoyed that one because it was about uh, a young woman who was stopped in a small town for speeding and they kept her there because she was a doctor and the doctor wanted to retire so they had an excuse to keep her there for a while and all the interesting things that she learned 
about being out in the country and about people and that she wouldn't have in her practice in the big the bigger place but uh, it was like a coming home for her and that's one of the examples of how much this theme is growing in the world is to come home to uh, rescue your grandmother's house there's plenty of those themes you know where someone's left their grandmother's house in a will and she has to live there for a year to get it she has to fix it up and and of course these things actually do happen in real life I've heard of them and so I wanted to mention that because if you have an undesirable place and you've really wanted something a little bit better sometimes you can uh, plan things on paper or look for things and just the pursuing of it and the and the drawing and the planning of something that you want to do can be very satisfying and and the idea of coming home and going to something that is more simple can be very very appealing now I want to show you what I've been doing I've been making this is autumn here and I've been making pumpkins out of whatever scraps I can find and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a gingham pumpkin <laughs> but I made this and this is just a, a paper napkin with um, school glue on it to make it look like the stem see there and then what to stuff them with if you want to be really frugal and you don't want to use the polyester fiber fill uh, wadding stuffing you can put you know we're all getting a lot of packages in the mail because we order more things and I showed you last time how I was using the paper bag material. I also made a wreath out of a paper bag and paper brown paper which I'll show you another time. I have seen so much bubble wrap that I can't keep it all. I, I wouldn't use it all. I'm not going to mail out that many things so I stuff my little pumpkins with it. Or another thing you can do is if you get a lot of plastic bags from the grocery store and you're just overloaded with them and you're not going to use them all you can wad them up and stuff them, stuff a little pumpkin with them. Now the other thing I wanted to show you, I've talked to you before about uh, an online Zoom art class that I was taking with Susan Rios of Cal in California and you've probably seen her calendars and her artwork and some of the old Emily Barnes books and they're just beautiful. So I wanted to show you one of the paintings I did with her and then um, so I just thought it might be fun to show you. She sends a picture of what she wants us to paint and this was a, a cup a big coffee cup full of fresh hydrangeas and everybody has their own interpretation of it so I freehanded mine and this is what I came up with and um, so I, and then I want to show you another thing is that I started a class with a young lady that has been to my house many times and she's just starting uh, to do these online she's a, a homemaker she's a homeschool daughter and she lives at home with her parents and she wanted to do something that would help other people through isolation and hard times so she started a zoom class and it was a art journaling so I've always wanted to do art journaling so I started it and this is my first this is my first picture here and so I thought I'd like to show that to you I think that this is going to be interesting and so I also I'm going to read to you today after I review my notes a little bit and make sure that I have said everything that I've got here and one of the things is to encourage you to exercise your freedom at home as a homemaker your freedom to be better your freedom to go further don't just give everything a swipe but on purpose make it look nice now I read about a woman many years ago there used to be books that you could get with people's autobiographies and they weren't famous people they just told about how they moved to a a pioneer town somewhere in the 1950s maybe and this one woman had moved to a desert town that was just being developed and she told all about uh, how she had to look around to find things to make her home cozy the there were no places to go to get the things that she needed and she took this little cabin this little desert shack you might call it and she made it very pretty using things like you know you I don't know if you realize you could make um, 
wallpaper, cabinet tops, and flooring out of ordinary paper and just by shellacking it. And she did so many interesting things. And when you've put a lot of yourself into your house, even making things like this, these pumpkins, and that it, it gives it more more life and more warmth and more part of your creativity. So I wanted to show you that you need to exercise your freedom to be creative, creative at home. There aren't any rules. And just because it's not trendy, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. And I have seen some really cute things that people have made in isolation and you know without uh, being held back by by being uneasy about whether something is going to be acceptable or not or whether everyone else is doing it or whether you're going to look weird people can really be more creative you know we're in an era where I hear a lot of women saying they wish they were back in a certain time where clothing was nice and it was more the kind they liked and it was always some historical period that they admired well if you'll go on Pinterest and type in cottage core clothing, you'll see it is going back. It is going back to this look of um, maybe uh, think 1980s or Victorian or even the 1930s, 40s, 50s that the clothing that people are creating and going back to is really nice so if you want to type that in cottage core on Pinterest for clothing but other things will come up too like home decorating and that's one thing I think that it's a shame to neglect is home decorating because now you can do so much more than we used to be able to do that I can remember back in the day when all we had on our wall when we were growing up was a moose head and a, and there was a gun cabinet. You know, that was just what it was like on the wilderness. And uh, my father decided to paint and he painted uh, some canvas pictures and hung them on the wall, which helped a lot. But now there's so much you can do that's so interesting. And I like to watch uh, the videos and they relax me. They call me. I might not do them, but I like to see what other people are doing. And so use your freedom at home to exercise your creativity and, um, and in a way create your contentment. So, and be fit and healthy and be creative at home. I look up Cottage Core and learn something new. I've emphasized this in the past. Always be a, a able to learn something new. If you feel yourself getting a little bit uh, restless or depressed, go and learn something new. And you might even do things outside. I do have a garden outside. It didn't do as well as I wanted to this year, but at least I did it. It's a delight to go out there and walk in it, to see it. And you might start a Bible self-improvement course. And I had told you about this before. Um, and it was... Ian, if you wanted to have a Bible self-improvement course, you might try this this art journal idea and do this thing here in 2 Peter chapter 1. I've read this to you before. I only quote just a very few um, character building scriptures to you because I don't want to overwhelm you and most people never get time to write about every one of them. But in this verse, there are so many characteristics uh, character qualities that you could do a study on put it in your art journal and find something that goes with it some art some idea from art that goes with it uh, maybe a dove for peace you know peacefulness is part of our lives or something like that and learn two things learn art and you can actually get free lessons in videos all over the place on the web and learn many different things but this is what I wanted to read you and I've read this to you before because when you do a study on these things you are taking a course in character this is the one thing they're not doing very much of and even in churches tend to gloss over it but it's so important. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. This is Second Peter chapter 1. Supplement your faith with virtue. 
And the way that it's worded is that you don't just make a list. Oh, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly love. You don't just make a list like that and say, oh, okay, I'm going to do all this, check it off. You study how it's put together, just like you would a recipe, such as supplement your faith with virtue. Well, that would mean that you would add something to your faith and with virtue. And then you've got to study what, what is virtue. It's strength. It's the practice of goodness. And to virtue, knowledge. And then you have to ask yourself, why is it in this order? Because faith will have to come first and goodness will be, have to be added to it. There's a reason for that. And then then you add knowledge to virtue. Now, why would knowledge come first in all that list? Because knowledge can give people a big head. It Knowledge puffs up, the Bible says. Some types of godly knowledge is very important. But there's a reason why all this stuff is, th is there. I'll just read it to you. I want you to ponder on it. Write it in your little... Uh, Write it in your little art journal, or if you wanted to do separate pages for each characteristic, character quality, you could do that too. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. And I love uh, the next verse that comes with it. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, you know, um, the Bible talks about abounding and, and abundance and how important that is. And we need to abound and to thrive. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. Do you know what nearsighted is? Um, I'm nearsighted. I have is myopia where I can see everything up close. I can function just fine without my glasses. But I have when I drive, I have to have glasses so I can see a longer distance. Nearsighted just means you only see things up close. You don't see the whole picture. I think that's interesting. He is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more di diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And these are, these are hard. These are difficult. You need to practice them. And it, it helps us as adults to practice them because then we feel more qualified to teach, to teach others. And we need to do them first before we attempt to teach them to other people. Now, if you have children that are growing up and you want to study this and you want to use them as character training, say, children, I was not brought up to do this and I want you to help me. Let's just all help each other. We'll learn, learn together. So let's start with the first one. And you all learn together and get some really good feedback from them. And I always said I grew, my children and I grew up together because we homeschooled together and so today I'm going to read some more of the Jane Austen diet. And I hope you're not bored with this, but I am fascinated with this chapter on health and happiness and how they're interconnected. And I told you before in a previous video how it was the custom back in the day, uh, and I still remember some of it maybe in the late 50s, early 60s, where the farmers or the homesteaders like us we we wanted to catch the the last of the light and go for a walk down the road. Um, just it was a slow walk, and we would just talk and think, and it was just the last little activity outside we did before dark descended and before we went to bed, and it was such a wonderful time. And so it was all replaced by uh, men who were in a rush because they had spent the day at work in the nine to five the new nine to five thing that was going on and they would come home exhausted sit in front of the tv and to relax and so it was too late to go for a walk and so that was and then of course the television gave them their narrative of what they believed and they didn't even know they were being sucked, sucked into s some things uh, and they were losing their way of life but we can get it back we can just by living it we can get it back we can get back our style we can get back our 
way of life, we can get back the things that, you know, when you watch an old movie, you'd say, oh, you know, I, I just want to live back there. You can do it. You just do it by doing it. And uh, you can do what you want. So practice your freedom. So the, the name of this Courting negative thoughts is always, this is called uh, The Jane Austen Diet by Brian Kozlowski, and I actually contacted him, and he gave me permission to read it aloud. So I'm going to read parts of it aloud to you. I haven't actually read it as a book aloud. I'm just picking parts that I think might interest the homemaker. And most of us are just really involved with the Jane Austen movies because they were wholesome enough to raise our children when we wanted to watch a movie or read a read a book these were wholesome enough for them and so they could they had a humor to them and my daughter especially loved them and we had for a long time every year or so we would have a Jane Austen tea where everyone dressed like the Regency era and we came and had tea and had a meal together and went for a, a walk uh, a turn about the room. I went for a walk outside and uh, just enjoyed it so much. Those days uh, were just as good as going back to the old times. So, courting negative thoughts is always a dangerous business in Jane's novels. It won't just ruin your happiness, it will wreck your health. Which brings us to the biggest health horror of Austin world stress. Now, I may have read this to you before because it's been a week since I've been back broadcasting. And um, because I'm getting elderly, I'm forgetting where I put, the, you know, I put the bookmark in the wrong place and then forget. It looks kind of familiar, but uh, I read new things every day. Stress in my poor nerves. Stress in Austin world? Surely not. What calm lives they had, those people sniffed Winston Churchill, not exactly enthralled by the action-packed sequence of pride and prejudice. No explosions, no battle scenes, no terrorist threats. What could Austinites possibly be stressed out about? Their tea not being hot enough? It's a stereotype that has amode Jane's critics since the very beginning. I should hardly like to live with her ladies and gentlemen in their elegant but confined houses, yawned Charlotte Bronte in 1848. Much too commonplace and neat for her wilder passions. Um, pardon me, are we all reading the same books here? Because stress is not only very much present in Austin world, it's practically an ec epidemic. You know, I wrote a book about, uh, my parents and I wrote a book together about life on the homestead in Alaska, and one of the things that someone said was, well, you just wrote it all through rose-colored glasses because there's no stress in there. But if you look carefully, there was. There was a tremendous amount of, uh, for us, we felt it, uh, like the time the car broke down in the middle of winter and uh, it wouldn't go and somebody fi um, somebody in a huge logging truck came, came and got us and took us to a restaurant and um, the children were so cold and they were all crying. It was really a bad time. And then another time where we came home and we had left in such a hurry because we wanted to catch the sunlight and everything that the dishes weren't done. So my mother just turned them upside down. And another time when one of my brothers fell in the, in the lake and another brother rescued him. I mean, these things were stressful to us. And, and then we had the, the other common things that, that people, you know, waking up to find a, a moose leaning against your door to get warm. Those animals are huge. And um, so, but you know, when you read it, from your own point of view, you don't feel it as much. But I don't know why I brought that up. It's because he said here that there was stress woven all through uh, Jane's novels, but we don't all see it. And it's the same with the Bible. You know, I've talked to you about uh, wolves in the church, and I've talked to you about people who mess up the economy and people who try to destroy other people's way of earning a living and we think oh you know I wish we were back in bible times you know we'd be safe then but it's in here it's all in here we just don't want to see it and uh we we think that it's that it's all go it's all wonderful but 
they had their stress too, but they told how to deal with it and what the consequences of certain things were. Because stress is not only very much present in Austin world, it's practically an epidemic. Granted, Jane never uses the word stress like we use it today. I suppose they use the word distress. Stress wasn't coined as a biological condition until the 1930s, but she certainly knew it by other names. A multitude of Regency terms like flutterings and fidgets, agitations, vexations, and above all nerves are the historical equivalents to what we would now recognize as physiological stress. They fizz up in Jane's novels with vengeance. Once you take off the rose-tinted spectacles, I'm looking at you, Charlotte, you'll find Austin World is seething with some of the most intensely stressful scenarios any of us will ever face. Your son falls from a tree, nearly paralyzing himself in persuasion. Your home may be handed over to a distant relative at any moment, pride and prejudice. Your once substantial income drops to near poverty levels overnight sense and sensibility. Yep, all of us, even today, everybody I know is just kind of living on the edge of, of uh, living in their car. You know, everybody's just living on the very edge of everything. Small wonder many Austin characters find it difficult to cope with the stress Mrs. Bennett most iconically. The constant frazzle of getting five daughters married before her husband kicks the bucket, when Mr. Collins in turn will kick herself and her daughters out of the house is too much for her per poor nerves to bear. She eventually snaps, becomes bedridden by the financial anxiety. You know, they had their meltdowns too, didn't they? But, you know, some of the things I'm trying to tell you as a homemaker is you have to keep your mind healthy and your body healthy so that you don't have these meltdowns, and especially if you have children, even if they're grown and gone, they're going to be watching you to see how you handled that the age that you're in now and uh, they're going to take a lot of strength from it they're going to learn about life from it mrs bennett was really in a most pitiable state i am frightened out of my wits she says and have such trembling such flutterings all over me such spasms in my side and pains in my head and such beatings at heart that i can get no rest by night nor by day well i'm sure everyone has felt like that sometime in their life if that's not an accurate description of extreme stress in action i don't know what is Yet the idea that this was acceptable, nay, encouraged behavior was rampant through the late 18th century. Ever since Jane was young, stress itself was viewed as the right and prerogative of the rich and the well-off. The more stress you felt, the more you demonstrated to the world how truly delicate and sensitive your wealthy, soft-pampered body actually was. The common catchword for this having a heightened sensibility was one of the most fashionable afflictions in england at the time mainly affecting the nerves a regency woman who caught the sensibility bug disdains to be strong-minded wrote a cultural observer in 1799 she trembles at every breeze faints at every peril and yields to every assailant austin knew real life strutters of this sensibility writing about one acquaintance who rather enjoys her spasms and nervousness and consequence they give her. It's the same sensibility Marianne wallows in throughout the novel that bears its name, feeding and encouraging her anxiety as a duty. Readers of the era would have found nothing out of the ordinary in Marianne's high-strung embrace of stress. What's or extraordinary is Jane's response to it. Now, I wanted, wanted to tell you what I was thinking while I was reading this, because I've mentioned Linda Lichter's book, The Benevolence of Manners, or... Um, I'm trying to think what the other title was. It came up under uh, an, another title. She her original one was Benevolence of Manor, but then she had a reprint. And but it was about the Victorian era and how they would have been astonished at the current era and their desire for constant happiness. They on the other hand, didn't pursue the happiness as much as they pursued doing the the good deeds and applying their minds to something that what they knew would result in happiness. So 
do not give way to such gloomy thoughts. This is in, I believe this might have been in um, Pride and Prejudice. Um, trying to think of the name of that that book, uh, The Benevolence of Manners, or... Hmm. Rather than taking the normal Regency stance, viewing stress as an innocent indulgent of the upper classes, letting Marianne enjoy her sensibility and peace, or allowing Mrs. Bennet her nervous tantrum in bed, Jane makes it repeatedly clear that stress is not to be trifled with. It's no random pattern that stress sickens, weakens, and incapacitates more bodies in her novels than anything else. Jane took stress seriously. If you doubt it, try getting chronically stressed out in Austin World. She'll usually threaten you with death for doing so. Marianne is the classic example. After being dumped by Willoughby, she stews for weeks in silent agony till her heart was so heavy that no further sadness could be gained, and this nourishment of grief was every day applied. Later, the severity and danger of her deadly illness is directly attributed to her many weeks of previous emotional stress, which Marianne's disappointment had brought on. And we know that there have been generations that haven't been taught to deal with distress, and it's wonderful if you have a family that's very supportive and instead of teasing you for it or condemning you for it, will help you to direct it in a way that it will be beneficial to you and to others. Then again, she's just one of the many stress-induced sufferers. Take Jane Fairfax in Emma, for example. Anxiety written throughout the whole novel. The stress of constantly hiding her engagement to Frank Churchill soon manifests itself in severe headaches and nervous fever. Her health seemed for the moment completely deranged. Elsewhere in the novel, Mrs. Churchill, Frank's aunt, is one of those remarkably rare characters to actually die in the course of an Austen novel. What kills her off? Stress. Her nerves were under continual irritation and suffering. Mrs. Bennet gets a sort of deathbed warning, too. Being constantly in the fidget, suffering from chronic fear that her husband will die, leaving her homeless, that sounds like the rest of us, doesn't it, will probably have the reverse effect in the end. As the far calmer Mr. Bennet Riley portends, my dear, do not give way to such gloomy thoughts. Let us flatter ourselves that I may be the survivor. <laughs> Even by today's standards, Jay's, Jane's death by stress plot lines seem pretty intense, more often chalked up to romantic exaggeration than medical sense. Many people still regard stress with Regency lackness, viewing it as inevitable and normal part of life. But since the 1950s, science has been playing catch-up with Jane, gradually defining the seriousness of stress in almost identical ways. We now know that stress should only be a quick, short-term sensation. And I suggest that, unfortunately, the medical profession will treat it for a lifetime. They will keep you on something. You, you have uh, something, some stress that comes up and they will want to tell you it, you know, I'll give you some kind of temporary relief, but that soon becomes a lifetime. And I'm, I'm concerned about that, about the way that we treat it. And because it was, it's an old thing. It's not something that's unnatural. And there has to have been a way that people dealt with it in the past. And I, you can see throughout the Bible how it's done. Many animal benefit, animals benefit from the involuntary stress reaction. Its primary purpose has been to keep us and our ancestors alive during life-threatening situations, stopping normal body functions and diverting all energy into the things, heart, brain, and limbs, that help us quickly avoid or surmount the danger. To use a period example, let's just say you'd feel more like running or fighting not casually using the restroom when being charged by Napoleon's infantry at the Battle of Waterloo. When stress, however, is allowed to linger, when we replay those life battles in our brains or worry about other battles in the future, our normal body functions are given the chronic cold shoulder. Crucial biological processes like healing, cell growth, proper digestion, <clears throat> metabolism, and weight manage are, management are all part are all put on minimal priority mode. 
when stress is activated. Yes, when you're under stress, you cannot accomplish anything else and you're no good to anyone. That is so sad and I'm sure it's happened to everybody. Austin was very wary of this sort of long-term stress. Yeah, people have known about this since the beginning of time. Remember when God told Cain, "Why are why is your countenance down? Why are why are you wroth? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up?" You know, why why are you so looking so depressed? If you do well, will not you perk up? And so this is what uh, Linda Lichter's book, The Benevolence of Manners, was emphasizing was that the Victorians sought to do well in order to feel well. And it's a hard thing to do if you're in the habit of being discouraged. You almost have to have a, a daughter or a mother or a friend or a husband to help you get started, have a list of things to do. And I, I make these lists. I make 20 things long and then I don't ever obey myself and, and I'll sit there thinking you know it's it's, it's kind of gloomy around here and, and it won't occur to me that you know if I just did one thing on that list it would lift the gloom and uh, and if I had if you have I noticed uh, routines and things that you do throughout the day no matter what kind of climate it is you're going to do certain things at certain times it does keep everything steady in your mind Her healthiest characters are always trying to limit the time frame of their stress response to be only vexed for a moment, not for days or weeks. A stressful thought might be involuntarily, says Eleanor, but I will not encourage it. Left in romantic limbo by Mr. Bingley in Pride and Prejudice, Jane Bennett has every right to be chronically stressed too, but her good sense soon prevails, helping her to check the indulgences of those regrets which must have been injurious to her own health. The real injurious nature of stress is how much it weakens our immune system. Sorry about the light. We are having a sunny day and the sun is now going down. A stressful... Um, <clears throat> A stressful thought might be involuntary, says Eleanor, but I will not encourage it. Left in romantic limbo by Mr. Bingley in Pride and Prejudice, Jane Bennett has every right to be chronically stressed too, but her good sense soon prevails, helping her check the indulgences of those regrets which must have been injurious to her own health. The real injuries nature, injurious nature of stress is how much it weakens our immune system, maintaining a healthy immune system being another non-essential when you're running from a Napoleonic cannon. <laughs> Chronic stress dramatically reduces our ability to fight everything from the common cold to cancer, impeding natural repair processes that defend us against viruses, tumors, and inflammation. He has a footnote here, and it's I'm just going to look it up. Uh, the American Heart Association, July, July 26, 2016. And that's where he got that quote from. And he is very well documented. He has John Hopkins University. He has the uh, Mayo Clinic. He has all these things. Very well done. An astounding 75 to 90% of all doctor's visits are now estimated to be stress and inflammation related. Over 200 years ago, Austin was reflecting these statistics with staggering accuracy. Most illnesses in Austin world have a corresponding nervous component. When her friend uh, Emma recognizes a nervous part to her complaint when her friend Harriet suffers from a severe cold and sore throat. Coincidentally, Harriet has just spent the past few weeks in a constant emotional flutter over Mr. Elton. In Mansfield Park, the stressful nugget of news that Maria has run off with Henry is enough to derail Fanny's immune system. She passed only from feelings of sickness to shudderings of horror and from hot fits of fever to cold. 
One of the last characters Austin created, Arthur Parker in Sandenton, a man with more illnesses than you can count, has a hunch that they all point back to stress. I'm very nervous, he says. To say the truth, nerves are the worst part of my complaints, in my opinion. But the injury of stress goes even deeper than that, damaging our bodies on a genetic level. The ends of our tightly wound chromosomes, capped by a protective telomere, the gene genetic equivalent to the hard tip on a shoelace string, are particularly sensitive to stress. Now, some of my friends and me and my descendants got in a discussion about stress and asked the question, how, when was the last time you were really relaxed and happy? And we've realized how many years we had spent worrying over things and, and being in stress and, and being uh, overly concerned about people, especially people, maybe people who weren't doing the right thing, people who had left their spiritual journey and gone the other way into the world. And we, we, we did agonize over these people. And then we realized we could no longer do it because we had not produced anything from it. It did not help the people at all. They, they weren't any closer to uh, being restored to their families or uh, to the Lord. And we had not produced, we had not lived any of our ambitions and dreams of, well, you know, the art journal and the, and the, the sewing and the, and the homemaking and the decorating and stuff. So we decided we would not be able to do that anymore. And we did not want our children to remember us because we could, we could count quite a few years where our children only knew us when we were tense. So we didn't want that legacy. So we decided that would have to stop, that our families only knew us when we were under stress. We cannot do that. So we eliminated a lot of things, uh, and particularly the bad news on television. Most people got rid of their televisions and became more selective in the kind of information coming into their house and we began to do our own writing reading plays uh, art and singing and just learning uh, how to live without that stress but I think that's what hits a lot of young women at last when they realize their children only knew them have only known them so many years in stress but never knew them when they weren't uh, when they weren't under stress. We don't want that. And that, that really makes you snap out of it. It's a, uh, it's a habit. It's like, a, it's like an addiction. And they say adrenaline is the drug of choice. While, while telomeres naturally wear down over time, gradually frazzling our cells and thus aging our bodies, stress can dramatically accelerate the process. People who live under chronic stress have shorter telomeres that, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, that sometimes look 10 years older than people with less stress in their lives. Again, Austin doesn't miss a biological beat. The characters who experience the most intense stress in her books look literally frazzled and aged beyond their years. Mr. Woodhouse in Emma, for instance, he was a nervous man with a long-running relationship with stress. <laughs> there is no rest for his nerves, and he looks like a much older man than he actually is. Yet Marianne proves an even bigger warning on the aging effects of stress. Starting the novel, A Vibrantly Beautiful Girl, her later Willoughby-induced stress takes a physical toll. Stress affected every feature, giving her a hollow eye and sickly skin look. Even lovable Edward and Mrs. Jennings can't help but notice she's an altered creature. Her less-than-lovable brother-in-law is a bit blunter than that. Poor Marianne. You would not think it, perhaps, but she was remarkably handsome a few months ago quite as handsome as Eleanor. Now you see, it is all gone. If Austen's own life imitated her art, you know, I wish I'd grown up uh, just reading Jane Austen novels instead of going through public school. Some of the stuff that we had to read absolutely had no character value for me. And although they tried to, you know, tell us, you know, this person was a bad character and everything, it wasn't like learning character, learning to control your emotions or learning uh, real character. 
and uh, because this is so rich and I'm so happy that my children got to have it in their homeschool years. If Austin's own life imitated her art, it's easy to explain why she was so interested in writing about stress and its damaging effects. It was a personal fight. Her surviving letters reveal a woman who was often tempted to indulge in chronic stress, in anger, in money worries, and the endless frustrations of being an intelligent, independent woman in a world which maddeningly limited her freedom. Her biographer, David Noakes, would go on to argue that Austin chose the alias Mrs. Ashton Dennis for writing irritated letters to her publishers just so she could sign it with a clever hint. I am gentleman and mad. <laughs> we don't know how mad or stressed Austin allowed herself to get, but we do know how greatly she admired the mental composure of her sister Cassandra, a real Eleanor and calmer role model throughout Jane's life. Cassandra was no stranger to stress herself. Her fiancé died in a heartbreaking incident when she was in her early 20s, but the way Cassandra bravely dealt with the grief, with a degree of resolution, installed her in Jane's respect forever. With a temper always under command, Cassandra must have taught Jane little secrets for managing her own stress, as Austin would soon fill her novels with them. There are numerous brilliant ways to de-stress in Austin world, and whether we have Jane or Cassandra to thank for these strategies is a moot point. The point is they work. They obviously work for Jane, and they still work today. So please take Mrs. Bennett's advice and have a little compassion on your poor nerves. Now I will read uh, another, another paragraph, and then I will quit for now and try to come back more often. I will be mistress of myself. Now I looked up what this meant in that day, and it just meant to be guarding your own moods and be in self-control and to control your own character. I had it written down here in a way that I said uh, to master of your own mind to rule your own to rule your own self so that you had self-control. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't believe that because they just believe that uh, whatever they do it just comes natural, just do what natural, and, and they don't think too much about the consequences of it. <clears throat> Interestingly, the most stressed out minds in Austin world share one thing in common, a lack of control. Now isn't that interesting? That's why I want you to read Second Peter chapter 1, I believe it's verses 5 to 8 that I read to you. <clears throat> it mentions self-control. And you need to study it and look it out and give some examples to yourself. <clears throat> I hope my voice lasts long enough to finish this. Pick any anxious character, Mr. Woodhouse, Mrs. Bennett, Mary Musgrove, Jane Fairfax, Marianne. Their individual stress always stems from not feeling in control of either their money, their house, their love lives, their husbands, their children, their bodies, or their futures. Austin lays out her psychological theory again and again. One's mental comfort or chaos primarily depends on feeling under command of the situation. I have seen this in certain, certain people have this, and I'm wondering if it's their mothers and grandmothers that um, embedded it in them. They, see, they seem to have a natural way of controlling things. <clears throat> Austin lays out her psychological theory again and again. One's mental comfort or chaos primarily depends on feeling under command of the situation. As Emma reminds Frank Churchill, once he calms down after a grumpy snap, you are comfortable now because you are under command. You had somehow or other broken bounds yesterday and run away from your own management. I love that, your own management. You know, how are you managing? How are you managing yourself? You have run away from your own management. That just means self-control. Austin would have to wait a few years for that theory to be proven, but proven it was. Throughout the late 20th century, one of Britain's longest-running research project called the Whitehall Study revealed the powerful benefits in feeling of feeling in control, tracking the long-term health of over 28,000 workers in the British Civil Service 
It found something that defies the usual workplace stereotype. People higher up in the office hierarchy, people who had more control in their jobs, actually had less stress, less disease, less longer lifespans, and that their sub than their subordinates. Even with more workplace responsibility, feeling able to confidently manage daily situations acted like a permanent stress reducer. You know, we might try that. What about uh, that laundry room that needs to be cleaned up? What about all the old shelves that you haven't been through in years? Could that, could cleaning those and managing them reduce your stress? I think so, and they, I've understood that people who are under severe stress, when they get under some kind of care, medical care or whatever kind of therapy, they're told to go home and sort through a pile of papers or a pile of books, and that that's part of the therapy. That's why we're so blessed to have housework, because it really is their good therapy. Putting this into practice, you might want to start thinking like a boss, a Regency boss. Lizzie does so in Pride and Prejudice. When confronted with the daunting task of meeting Lady Catherine, the biggest boss in the Austin world, Lizzie puffs up her self-confidence. Notice the change in the character that plays Lizzie in Pride and Prejudice, the BBC production, the series of how uh, at first, you know, she's quite cordial to Lady Catherine, and then she, you can just see her rising up uh, with a determined set of her jaw and, and her posture changes and everything. And, you know, let me see what she says here. Um, she therefore walks up to Cath Lady Catherine's imposing house. Her, trem her tremulous companions, not so much. They kind of hang back a little bit. When they ascended the steps to the hall, Maria's alarm was every moment increasing, and even Sir William did not look perfectly calm, but Elizabeth's courage did not fail her. While the others were frightened almost out of their senses, Elizabeth found herself quite equal to the scene. Feeling equal to the Lady Catherines of life, feeling you can handle an unexpected workload, a financial curveball, a family argument, or an, in my case, publishing a deadline, a publishing deadline is crucial to keeping stress at bay. When Louisa falls off the seawall at Lyme in persuasion, dangerously concussing her head on the cobbles, Anne is the only one who keeps her senses, the only one to remember the obvious next step when a bonneted head comes crashing down onto the pavement. A surgeon, a surgeon this instant. None of us can control how often we are, as Austin would say, knocked about by life. But we can control our responses to it. In sense and sensibility, Eleanor constantly chooses calm, finding immense strength in simply remembering that she has the power to choose it. I will be calm. I will be mistress of myself. I will manage myself. As Austin knew, there's always that crucial moment between the stressor and our reaction to it. And if nothing else, that one moment is entirely within our control. Between stimulus and response, there is space, goes the mindfulness mantra often attributed to Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom. I'm going to read uh, one more page because it's a big, it's a big amount here. So I'm just going to read one more page and then I will come back another day. Laugh as much as you choose. Laughter was always integral to Austin's life. The earliest stories to plop from her pen as a teenager were comedies with slapstick plot lines crafted to elicit a well-timed chuckle. Studying these early texts, Virginia Woolf once asked the important rhetorical question, what is this note which never merges in the rest which sounds distinctly and penetratingly all through easy it is the sound of laughter it echoes in austin's personal letters to her sister with witty jokes dolloped throughout and rings loud in pride and prejudice lizzie is always ready for a good laugh making her the self-proclaimed happiest creature in the world and certainly the happiest heroine i dearly love a laugh follies and nonsense whims and inconsistencies do divert me i own and i laugh at them whenever i can you know the bible says laughter is the best medicine and there have been studies done on this uh, 
about the heart and laughter and blood pressure, etc. Lizzie is always ready for a good laugh, making her the self-proclaimed happiest creature in the world and certainly the happiest heroine. I dearly love a laugh, follies and nonsense. Whims and inconsistencies do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can. Laughter is both an emotional shield and a sword to Lizzie, helping her to lighten awkward situations, painful rejections, oh, like being called only tolerable by Darcy, and most importantly, stressful situations. It was necessary to laugh when she would rather have cried. Lizzie's laugh away the blues reflex is such a well-known family fact. When Jane Bennett spends a few sad months pining over Mr. Bingley, her Aunt Gardner flatly admits that Lizzie would have dealt with the stressful situation better. It had, hap it had better have happened to you, Lizzie. You would have laughed yourself out of it sooner. Oh, dear. So, ladies, I hope that you have got a few things done while you listened, and I hope to talk to you more and read a little bit out of uh, Beautiful Girlhood maybe next time. So remember, when you go to look up these virtuous things in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 8, and make yourself a little diary or a book for them and study them and define them and read them and put examples in sentences of faith, virtue, knowledge, and self-control and the other things found in that passage. So ladies, thanks for coming. Thanks for spending your time with me while you go about your work and I do hope it was a successful time for you. So I'll talk to you later. Bye.